Hello everyone, and welcome back to my Realism Overhaul series in Kerbal Space Program 0.24.2. In this episode, I hope to deal with one of the problems that I encountered when I transitioned from 0.23.5 to 0.24.2. And uh, no, that, that isn't all the weird debris that I have that probably looks very odd because uh, the tanks have resized or pro parts have resized. 206 pieces of debris, by the way. Uh, quite a debris field already. And uh, my persistent file... Uh, ever looking more like the actual persistent file of Earth, uh, if, you, if you would like to think of it like that. Uh, but uh, no, we're not going to focus on, on that or on whatever it just turned me to. No, I want to focus on Pratchett Station. And what's the problem with Pratchett Station? Well, I'll show you. Uh, the problem is this. Uh, the and it's uh, just sort of spinning around aimlessly. Okay, first of all, it was always a very small station, uh, just a bunch of docking ports with some fuel on it. Uh, second of all, uh, the Real realism overhaul mod, uh, when it got updated, resized this cube set, and that made this happen. So this is a little bit unsightly, and obviously the only thing to do would be to deorbit this and create a new station. And I'm not going to deorbit it just yet until we actually have another station up and running. But I want a, a larger station, a more substantial station. And so that's going to be my first goal for this episode. Now, launching a larger station... The reason this was this size was, was first of all, because we didn't have that big a launcher at the time. And also, it was because we don't have many of the, of the crew modules. In fact, uh, the only crew module we have is the Mark 1 pod, uh, which isn't really a station part in any reasonable sense. So that's a bit of a problem. We still don't have any other station modules, so we need, we need to do some more science to build up our station. Um, other than that, boy, this thing is just wiggling all over the place. Anyway, um, so yeah, I've, I've come up with a replacement for this. This, even its uh, meager size and it basically looks like a satellite with with docking ports is is 16.5 tons so it's already pretty heavy um, so we're not gonna be able to launch something huge at once but we are going to be able to make a substantial improvement so let's go to VAB and take a look at that and so here it is practice station advanced still in its fairing I didn't decide to change the name of the station what I did decide was to not name this new launcher after a Norse god or goddess, and that's because in trying to develop a new launcher, I, I generally start with what I've been working with, which was an RS-68A here. And uh, so I had the RS-68A in the center stack for the Magni launcher, and really the next level of development was just to put boosters with more RS-68As. And once I started doing that, uh, well, it, it just sort of became a delta, whether I liked it to or not. And so instead of trying to maybe mess with the numbers just a little bit here and there, I decided to just go for a delta heavy. Uh, so there's a delta four heavy, uh, similar, well, I'll say, except for the fact that I'm feeding fuel from the boosters into the center stack, it is the same as what's going to be launching the Orion uh, spacecraft in December. Um, it, uh, there is one uh, difference and that's that I'm not using the Delta Cryogenic second stage. That would go here and the reason is because our payload is just too tall and we don't need it. The second stage would boost it to higher altitudes but we don't need to do that with this launch. Okay, uh, so it, it does have the diameter of the of the normal uh, Delta stage. This is, uh, uh, they're called the Common Core Booster, uh, Common Core so there's a common core and it's a sort of a modular system where you can add them to the outside as well as boosters though uh, we have never seen four of them I mean in theory you could just uh, keep adding them as boosters but anyway um, a 5.1 meters is the diameter of the Delta system and Delta IV are heavy and uh, I didn't scale by length I scaled by propellant mass and so these tanks have the right amount of propellants altogether if you add the stuff in this, these tanks as well. So I gave it the right amount of propellant. I couldn't do it by stage time because I am doing the fuel crossfeed into the center stack. So I am staging it that way, which is not how the actual 
Delta Heavy works and that is why it's the Delta HX. So it's got a little bit more capacity than the normal uh, Delta IV Heavy and so we can expect that and that will be good because otherwise uh, really it's not much of an improvement on anything. Actually uh, the Magni probably does, does pretty well already. Uh, the, ma the latest version of the Magni launcher. Uh, it's, it's not too much different from this. But, uh, but I think uh, this will be a much quicker ride to orbit and it's more designed for sending stuff to orbit rather than sending stuff to the moon or the, the other planets. So that's the idea. Okay now having talked about the launcher a bit uh, I, I could have uh, even made, matched the colors by using multiple tanks, but I just decided not to do that. So, just a note on that. And anything else? No, uh, the, the payload is tall because it is a station, and it is a station in wondrous communicative, communicative glory because we've got all these, all these uh, antenna arrays. And so we're going to have a lot of communication capacity to use on this station. We will also have the Infernal Robotics that I recently added. Oh, I should have added uh, keys 3 and 4 to this. But um, yeah, so for the solar arrays, uh, we don't have very large solar panels. In fact, I've put the largest solar panels that we actually have uh, on there already. I don't, I think uh, they get more, yeah, these get uh, 3.6 per minute, whereas uh, these get 24.6 per minute. So they're the best we can do, but I would sure have liked the, the larger solar panels. I would also like to be able to create a rotating section. We do have the Rotatron, but we don't have the washers, and uh, those would be better, I think. Uh, I don't know too much about uh, Infernal Robotics just yet just the basics so um, so we'll have to wait until later to create a rotating section so that I, I would have uh, I've created a separate rotating section so that we could uh, create artificial gravity but that'll have to wait for now anyway uh, maybe we'll have two counter rotating section sections one on this side and one on that side and that'll balance out the, the angular momentum of the system but uh, we'll see about that Anyway, uh, of course a fuel tank, uh, and uh, actually I am only utilizing 50% of the actual possible volume, and that's just because of mass, otherwise it'd be too heavy to launch. And so uh, we've got uh, two tanks here, 50% of volume, and it is as you see it, uh, MMH N204, which is the, the, the best storable uh, propellants that I commonly use. I don't use uh, UDMH N204 as much, so this is probably okay. We've got a reaction wheel in here, and of course antennae, and a uh, remote guidance unit as the main controller. Otherwise everything else can be detached. You can see it's all attached by docking port. And so we can uh, take, we can replace this whole array if we get upgraded parts. Now there is no crew facility here because as I said, uh, well, we I, I lied a little bit. Uh, we have the Mark One command pod, but we also have this Freya uh, uh, CSV command capsule, and uh, I'd like. Uh, well, I mean, it's huge. Let's face it, and I'll have to think about how to use that. Obviously, this is a thought, and more more like something out here, but th there could be other things. Uh, I'll put that off to the side. We also have the Mark II cockpits and stuff like that, but I don't think that's appropriate for a space station, uh, though I'm sure somebody's used them. We don't have the normal uh, hitchhiker can. We don't have the re uh, research lab yet. And those cost a lot of science, I can tell you. But the, the research lab is the next one up, and that's 1,500 science. So we'll have to do some serious science to get at that, which is interesting because we've done a lot of science. In fact, in terms of sending missions out to planets, we might be further along than NASA was when it started making uh, its first space station. So, not sure, but anyway, uh, the science requirements are somewhat demanding, let's put it that way. 
All right. So anyway, I, I'm not like I pack this back up. I'm just going to go out to the launch pad and select it from there, and so I don't have to worry about uh, messing up the staging. But uh, this is mostly uh, docking. It's mostly replacing what we've already got in orbit as far as Pratchett Station is concerned. And but it's going to be doing it a whole lot better because it's got so much more to it. All right. Uh, and uh, total mass of the payload. I guess we can see that. Uh, so this is the payload, well actually this is the payload, 24.5 tons, well under the normal capacity for the, for the Delta IV Heavy launcher. So even if we weren't doing the fuel cross-feed, the Delta IV Heavy would be able to get this up into orbit. Alright, so uh, with that, let's go out to the launch pad and get this going. Okay, so here we are. We have to launch in the dark because I want it at a uh, similar inclination to the moon. And so this is our launch window. You can see I've got it at a uh, relative inclination to the moon of 0.47. And that's similar to the setup we had with the original Pratchett station. And uh, so that unfortunately that means we have to turn on the lights and the payload's lights are green. Uh, which uh, sort of clashes with the orange of the Delta rocket itself. But, uh, well, those are minor issues compared to what uh, we must normally deal with. So here we are. It, this is lighter than the normal Delta rockets right now. And that's again because we do not have the Delta cryogenic second stage and the RL-10B2 stage. And again that's because the payload is so tall and we don't really need the extra Delta V. So yes, that's the situation. Otherwise uh, that means that we've got uh, a lot more thrust to weight ratio of course. Uh, we're starting off with 1.43 and so we're going to be making our pitch program uh, sh uh, shallow. Uh, basically we're going to be turning much quicker. Okay, so with all that said, let's go for it. Throttle is up, SAS is on. Uh, we Hopefully the little remote con uh, guidance unit is okay with uh, remote tech, in which case this should switch from remote to local control to, uh, to connected. Uh, if it remains on local control, then we've got a problem. Okay, uh, all right. Well, I mean, this is a standard rocket, right? I mean, it should work, right? <laughs> Here we go. Pause a little bit. And off we go. We do have a little bit of drain because of the lights when we, we don't have the solar panels out, so that's a bit of a problem. Okay, I'm gonna have to be doing this stuff pretty quickly. I think, I think this is oriented so that uh, we should have roll 90. Yeah, it's not turning, so that's right. Uh, that's that's the direction we want to go in. So it'll remain flat is what I want. And we can pretty much start immediately. So uh, let's go to 88 first. Going to 85 now. So again, much quicker than I would normally take it, but does it seem a little bit tilted? I'm worried about the roll, that's all. No, it seems flat. It's important that we remain flat so that the boosters detach properly. I've only got one, uh, well, I mean, there's uh, four separatrons on each, but uh, that's just to balance it out, so hopefully they're strong enough. Going to 80. Now, in general, it's uh, wise not to go below 60 until you've passed Mach 1 on the pitch. So, so that's uh, sort of an important res reference point, but otherwise you can uh, go as quickly as you dare. We are past Mach 1 already. I'm just watching the prograde vector now. And once it gets over a uh, new 5 degree mark, I just go for that 5 degree mark. So again, the boosters are going to run out a lot quicker than the normal boosters for the Delta IV Heavy, and that's because I'm feeding fuel in from them to the center stack. That's okay, because the center stack has plenty of thrust. Actually, I think I should go to 45 right now. 
the structural mass of the of the stage is was fairly light compared to the real structural mass of the of the Delta IV Heavy. However, the engines seem to be a little bit heavier, and in particular, the huge fairings that we have on this were a lot heavier. So that's uh, sort of counterbalanced it out. The fairings are quite extraordinary. And we, we're going to have to carry them up a lot higher than the normal Delta IV Heavy would because um, because they don't decouple properly right now. And they're so big that they're probably going to be able to do some damage if they don't decouple properly. So I'm going to have to let them hang out for a little bit longer. We're going to be going for 300 kilometers. This is a station after all. I think we could probably even go higher than that. We'll see. But I'm going to say 300 kilometers initially. The RS-68As can throttle, but we don't need to do that at this point. It's not going to reach high Gs. But once we get to uh, close to orbit, the, the center engine will have to be throttled so that we don't uh, push any payload G limits. Okay, we're about to go for separation. I'm gonna go to... Oh, no, let's go for separation first. Okay, here we go. Okay, uh, good. Separation looks clean. That's one, one relief. Going to 25 degrees. You know, we have about 3 minutes and 30 seconds with burn time. Only two minutes, I mean, we've got a whole two minutes to apoapsis, which is a lot uh, compared to our burn uh, stage time. We can probably, I don't want to say we, we can decelerate, but we can definitely flatten out. One of the problems is, uh, I don't, th this can't be shut down and reignited. It's only got one ignition. So that was one of the benefits of the Delta cryogenic second stage is that uh, you could reignite it. I'm going to throttle down. I'm going to throttle down as much as possible. Because I think we're overdoing it here. Uh, well, let's say, it's not one third power by the way. Uh, the RS-68A is not uh, fully throttleable. It's, uh, it goes from uh, similar to the range of the spatial domain engines. Uh, probably like, well let's try it out quickly. So yeah, uh, this this is this is about uh, sixty six percent, seventy percent ish. The full delta V includes the fuel on the on the station, which is not really going to be used, uh, except for station keeping. Of course, it's got station keeping rockets, but that's about it. These are one kilonewton rockets. Once it stabilizes, I'll try to release the fairings. We really do need to dump them. Okay, looks like it's uh, at its mark, so let's try this. Okay, fairings, uh, go further. Oh, oh, oh. Uh. Wow, that is... Uh, that is a launch failure on fairing separation. Um, <laughs> I'm curious to see whether this thing can stabilize itself. It really can't do anything right now. Is it even firing SAS? Uh, RCS, I mean. Doesn't seem like it. Maybe it's not getting the signal. Let's try this. Ah, these might be misconfigured. Well, that's a second problem that we have. All right. Uh, huh. Back to the drawing board. Okay. Uh, so, uh, well, payload lost. Wow. And uh, we'll we'll head back to the VAB.
Now, just as a note, I did uh, make sure that I've got full ejection power and full torque on these uh, fairings. I could down the torque. Maybe it was tilting a little bit too much. But still, I think I'm going to bring the fairings up with us all the way. Now, uh, these, these were configured for hydrazine, darn it. I guess I should add another set down here, actually. Let's uh, just uh, copy and paste. Okay, that should do. So I'm going to carry the fairings up all the way to orbit and then dump them. Then if they decide to strike some lower stage, I'll, that, that won't matter to me. Alright, uh, so, well, looks like it's going to be a little bit more burdensome for this rocket, but it seems to be going quite well, actually. So, let's try this again. Okay, yeah, I didn't revert, so I'm still at the right inclination. Didn't have to do any time warping. Still in the dark, obviously. All right, uh, SAS on, throttle up, and let's make sure that our staging is correct because we don't want that to be messed up. Maybe instead of using four fairing pieces, I should just use like two. Would that mean a uh, lower probability of striking the rest of the ship? I don't know. Okay, that's good enough. Let's go. Ninety degrees was good. Let's execute that. Seems like uh, everything up to booster separation was okay, so I will catch you once we get to booster separation. Okay, we're getting ready for booster separation. I'm going to 20 degrees on the pitch before booster separation. One thing I look at is time to apoapsis. I generally like that around 1 minute and 40 seconds uh, when we go to uh, either a second stage. Uh, this is equivalent to a second stage, and so that's the general idea. Okay, here we go. Alright, booster separation is good. In fact, I can do even less than a minute and 40 seconds here, but I'm going to throttle down instead. Okay, we're past 150 kilometers in altitude. Apoapsis is 160 kilometers right now. Time to apoapsis uh, 50 seconds or so. Still going for 300 kilometers, but it's tough because the acceleration on this is pretty high. And uh, it's only going to get higher. We'll see how it goes. Okay, going to zero pitch now and hoping for the best. Trying to lower the throttle as much as possible. We've got, what, 2.3 G's right now in our acceleration. We've got almost 4 G's in potential if we were at max acceleration. Well, we're getting close to crunch time here. No choice but to level off here. We're not going to have a periapsis above 174. So I'm going to have to keep that in mind, not let this go too far. Okay, well, we can't relight now. It was It's either off or on. Okay, well, that's a little bit lower than I wanted it to be, but uh, I'll take it. Still got a uh, reasonable amount of fuel left. But here we go. Let's see what explodes what here. I already put the AIES antenna out. I hope it doesn't get clipped or anything. Alright. Uh, fairing separation. Uh, I guess we could do fairing separation and uh, payload separation at the same time. Let's do that. Uh, that didn't work. Still didn't work. Okay. 
Now, get away from the payload, you fairings. Away from the payload. Ah, <sighs> these guys. Okay, now I want prograde if possible. Let's test out. Okay, RCS is working. That's fine. Doesn't look like our, our reaction wheel is doing too much. So now I'm just uh, coasting to Apoapsis and then I can boost the orbit a little bit. I am going to figure out, let's see. We've got a bunch of tail facing engines up here, but I don't want these to light really. I could just do the rearmost ones. Going to boost the periapsis up to 300, and then that'll become our new apoapsis. Maybe 300 is a little bit too low. Wonder how ambitious I should be with using these tiny little one kilonewton rockets. It's a heavy payload, but not an impossibly heavy payload. Let's just uh, well, we'll see what kind of burn we can do. I'll I'll burn out a little bit more. Let's say 400. Okay, and two for solar panels. We also have solar panels on this module here. There you can see them. And that's because this module can detach. It's sort of a fuel tank. And so we can put a better fuel tank on it if necessary. Oh, this one solar panel that didn't get extended. Huh, I wonder how symmetry worked to have that single solar panel not extend. That's a weird one. Okay, and uh, target for the main dish will be active vessel, and we're going to activate it. Okay, there we go. Still looks like an overgrown uh, satellite, but but it's got its own merits. Now let's get it to the correct orbit. So we need a lot of stuff. We need bigger solar arrays. We need crew modules. The only thing we have a good decent amount of is antennae. So that's that's an interesting predicament we're in. We we need a lot of science. So I think in the next episode I'm going to be trying to send multiple probes to Dune, uh, Mars slash Duna, right, uh, uh, and to uh, the two moons, uh, Phobos and Deimos. I think that's our best bet for science. Uh, <clears throat> excuse me for science, and. It'll still take, uh, it'll be a multi-year mission still, but uh, it's probably, uh, we've done the moon quite a lot. Okay, well this will, ooh, I really pointed those in an inopportune direction, didn't I? They're basically set to torch anything that docks there. <laughs> that, that would not be good, no. Uh, oh well, that's a minor flaw in the plan, I think. So I'm getting ready to circularize now. Uh, we've got our apoapsis at 400 kilometers, and I forgot to mention something. We do have RTGs on board, uh, and they are right under the. Oop. Uh, yeah, it's in the dark, but that's where we have to do our burn. Yeah, right under the main dish. There they are. So we've got four snap RTGs, and that's what's what's generating electricity right now so that even in the dark uh, you can see we've got uh, 19 hours now and uh, in fact it'll all replenish once we get to the daylight side we're very very stable on electric charge the solar panels are, have more than double the electricity necessary okay go away go away electron uh, reflectron okay so here we are 401 by 400 is okay uh, much less eccentric than the I think the International Space Station is usually in a more eccentric orbit than that so uh, 
Yeah, the next order of business is, of course, uh, deorbiting the old Pratchett station. We don't really need two Pratchett stations in orbit. So now that we have this one, and, uh, well, I'll rename it later, uh, we can deorbit the other one. So let's see some fireworks. Well, so here we are going to deorbit Pratchett station, which I, well, the old Pratchett station, which I know is in a much higher orbit. Maybe I should put the new one in a higher orbit, but I'll do that later on. Anyway, uh, so the other one is at 400 and 1 by 400, so this is much higher. But, uh, yep, uh, a word about this uh, station. It has served us well any time on my interplanetary journeys where you saw the, the connection wink on and off every 40 minutes or so. Uh, that was because it was connecting through Pratchett Station. And so it has supported us for many, many missions. But now it must uh, meet its demise. It's got the MMH and N204 to retroburn, and in fact, I'm going to tell it to turn to retrograde slowly using its own reaction wheel. I do want this. Oops, come uh, the other way, the other way. I do want this to uh, meet its demise on the daylight time in the middle of the Indian Ocean. I think is the best place. So we're going to have a pretty sharp descent. Probably not so many fireworks because of that, but we'll see. This can deorbit itself separately. Does this have a... Yeah, this has a probe core. You know, this is has a viable probe core. Huh. This can operate separately. Does it have a... I don't know if it has a good antenna, though. Let's see. Planning for this, this antenna. Let's activate. But I don't see any way for it to replenish electric charge. Yeah, there's no way it can get electric charge. So there's no point keeping it up. Uh, the electric charge is all up here. Bad planning. Otherwise I could have kept the fuel up. Uh, this could have deorbited itself with its uh, little fuel there. And then this ugly situation could be could be dealt with. But unfortunately not not uh, possible because this thing does not have uh, well we could make it a dummy in other words it's just a floating fuel tank and uh, it wouldn't be able to be controlled but I don't think that's that's adequate that'll, that'll be too frustrating to uh, rendezvous with so let's just bring it all down it's all old stuff anyway uh, these are stretchy tanks instead of procedural fuel tanks so that already makes it bad. If I ever try and get rid of stretchy tanks from the save, uh, this will meet its demise anyway. Okay, so here we go. I think this is possibly the first time I've deorbited something in this save. Is that true? Might be. I mean, uh, considering how much junk I have in orbit, it seems likely though. Maybe I did something else. I forget should probably deorbit a lot more than I have. I suppose I probably don't need more lines on my map, but uh, I wonder if trajectories works in real solar system. I, I know it's designed to work with FAR, so that's not a problem, but uh, will it work with real solar system? If so, that might be helpful. Okay, I think I'm reasonably certain that we're going to have this meet its demise on the daylight side. Uh, there's some question about whether it's going to give Australia some fireworks or not, or whether it's going to be exploding over the Indian Ocean. But let's see now. I'll wait till periapsis negative 200, let's say. Okay, so now is the time to place your bets. So you can see our trajectory. It's like that. You can see our current altitude, our apoapsis and periapsis. So place your bets on what altitude you think this will meet its demise. By demise, we mean complete destruction of, uh, of both probe cores, let's say. We've got two probe cores here. And so the, the QBE and this uh, Ranger Mark III core now. When I built this, it wasn't a Ranger Mark III core, but now it is. Okay, go away. I hate when the messages don't go away. Okay. 
So, I trust you have made some some wager on that. I am not going to retract any solar panels. We will have everything fly off in some sort of brilliant display. Let's time warp to... Here we go, atmospheric interface. Uh, looks like we're already... Yeah, we're already next to Australia here. So, this is... Uh, Hello Australia, I'm going to give you some fireworks. We'll be uh, off of your north coast. Let's time warp a little, but not too much, otherwise we might uh, change the situation here. Far will tell us when things start being not nominal, I suppose. Okay, starting here, we'll go into normal time. 90, kilom 90, 000, 90 kilometers in altitude, and things are happening pretty quickly. I'm going to have uh, Smart ASS hold retrograde, and it can use RCS to do that. Oh, I hope we don't uh, end up uh, blowing up over here, shocking anybody. Would like it to be over the ocean. Not doing a particularly good job of keeping us retrograde, is it? Oh, it's probably orbital retrograde, that's why. Ooh, not that great. Okay. So those of you who said uh, 72 kilometers, you were wrong. We are now below 70 kilometers and the music is off. Temperature on the birthing mechanism at the bottom is rising as you see it. This is not a entry trajectory you would want to use for anything that you'd want to survive. Things are exploding. Oh, I think the birthing mechanism has already exploded. Conic service module is still going. Things are exploding. Oh, oh it's, it's lost control. Oh, things have fallen apart. Okay, we're following this bit, apparently. If uh, it turns out there's another piece, we'll, we'll try and keep track. There's that station probe. That should have a probe core on it, so we'll keep t uh, take a look. But we can only focus on this right now. Okay, well it's still surviving. Uh... Wow, is it still there? That's a water purifier. I don't think the actual probe core is still here, is it? Oh, that that's it. It, it flipped around. It just got me oriented incorrectly. So now a uh, water purifier getting to 1200 degrees Celsius, amazingly enough. The other probe still seems to be around. Ranger Mark III cores still hanging out. Pretty cool. Okay. G Force. G Force. Okay, and it, it looked like the other probe also had the same issue. Uh, we'll, we'll call it uh, 38 kilometers. Uh, I don't know if the other probe core survived longer. And the QBE. But, uh, yep, aerodynamic failure indeed. 38 kilometers. Uh, let's see the order of demise. Uh, it doesn't really, uh, it didn't track the other one unfortunately. It looks like the RCS ports first and then the docking port at the bottom. Then the tanks uh, failed due to aerodynamic stress. 
antenna. Antenna lasted quite a while, huh? And then uh, we actually had a separation where, uh, because of the uh, conic service modules blowing up, the clock restarted, interestingly enough. Anyway, there you have it. And uh, I don't believe the G-forces endured is correct because we clearly saw more than 15 Gs. So that is the end of the old Pratchett Station after 13 years and 266 days in service. And we will move on to bigger and better things in the next episode. I'm looking forward to some sort of mission towards Mars and its moons. All right. So thank you for watching. If you enjoyed this video, please do press like. If you have any comments or suggestions, please leave them in the comment section below. And I'll see you next time.